Oh, here we go. Meeting is now live on Facebook. Hi, guys. Hi, everybody. How are you? How are you doing, Julie? Nice to see you again. Yeah, nice to see you, James. Are you well? You're looking very yeah, tanned. Well, thank you. Well, that's this is Scottish tan, this is. Oh, really? Not. Yeah, we managed to get a few uh, a few days up there just not so long ago. So, yeah. Oh, nice. Um, so, yeah, well, thank you for joining us. Can you all hear us? Okay. Just see. Rosie, can you hear us okay? I think it's live. It's popping up on Facebook. Sounds good to me. So, okay, we'll assume everyone can hear us and we'll just kind of carry on. So, um, thank you for joining us. My name's Julie. So, I'm a vet, um, a bit like James, but obviously I'm a behaviour vet. With the accent, I've been in Sydney, Australia for the last 10 years and have just relocated back to the UK. So I actually don't know a lot of people out there in the behaviour world. So just introducing myself. And I think most of you will know James. Possibly. I don't know. I'm uh, So I'm, I'm James. Hi, everybody. Um, I am a GP vet in, in the southwest. I'm in Bristol. Uh, patron to the APBC, I'm very proud to say. I do quite a bit of uh, TV work as well, which is, is a lot of fun um and and i and i'm massively kind of into behavior but i i am very much your your first opinion gp vet so i'm really looking forward to to today to sort of pose all of the questions to julie as well to see it's one of those things isn't it where i think behavior is an area that we all feel that we could sort of whether it's do better but it's quite a it's quite a kind of you know you you, you just want to do the right thing and i think yeah. it's one area that a lot of vets start to feel quite, um, and vet nurses sometimes can easily start to feel a bit out of their depth. So I think it's going to be great to be able to put all that together today. No, I agree. And I think it's something that we shouldn't be scared about. I think sometimes as vets, we're a bit worried about talking to another vet or a behaviorist about behavior because we don't necessarily know the right terminology to use. And you feel a bit scared that you're going to say the wrong thing or you've been doing the wrong thing. So I think it's so important that we just kind of get out there and start discussing behavior a bit more, really. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, so if anyone's got any questions that they want to ask us, burning questions, just pop them in the Facebook um, live question section. Um, but otherwise, I think we'll just kind of get get started with having a bit of a chat. Yeah. So what's your biggest um, challenge, do you think, James, in general practice dealing with behaviour? Is it mainly dogs? Is it cats? Is it everything? Kind of what's your, your biggest? I think the, so I, th I think probably we get more dogs through that are I think I think from a client point of view I think more clients come to us aware of a behavioral problem with their dogs I think yeah. with cats maybe the clients almost don't necessarily recognize that it is a behavioral issue they see yeah. I think it's maybe sort of you know the cat might present with a physical ailment like cystitis and what have you and you have to almost convince them that there's a behavioral issue exactly. behind the scenes that they kind of don't really want to always engage that much with they kind of come to the vet because there's a problem and they want it fixed whereas the dog clients I suppose kind of come because they can definitely see that there's a behavioral problem the dog's got separation issues or aggression issues yeah um so I think sometimes the cha the challenge is always about engaging the client and and getting them on board but I think I suppose as well in general practice it's having the time you know it's having the time to properly yeah, get into sure. behavior yeah so that yeah, will be, I think that's what as, as a general practitioner is, is sort of the, the understanding the clients, but also having the time is, is what I've, what I've struggled with. Yeah. And I think from my perspective, that is also what I see. So I get a lot more canine referrals. I see a lot more dogs, even though I'm a crazy cat lady and I absolutely love cats. <laughs> um, but I think a lot of the time clients don't necessarily perceive that there's an issue with their cats because they're hiding away when people come or, you know, they're in the cupboard a lot of the time, but because they're not seeing the cat, you know, being aggressive, like they might see the dog or the dog's not reluctant to go on a walk, you know, cats don't, don't go outside so much on walks. So um, from a, from a veterinary behaviorist perspective, that's also kind of what I see as well. Um, yeah. For sure. mm. I think, as well as another challenge which i'd be interested to get your take on is how much as a gp vet a veterinary behaviorist or, or you know a clinical behaviorist actually wants us to sort of kind of get involved with it you know i think sometimes i feel certainly when it comes to aggression i feel very reluctant to start going into 
giving advice of any form almost i'd rather sort of say actually you need to stop here but where where do you where do you sort of see the role of the gp vet in the work you do what do you want from us almost is what i'm saying yeah so i think obviously the most important thing is talking to the client about the fact that they need to seek professional help so they need to go and see an apb apbc clinical behaviorist or a veterinary behaviorist i think that's the first hurdle and then from my perspective, it's about ruling out there being a sort of an actual physical problem going on. So we know that pain, for example, is really overrepresented in the cases that I see as a veterinary behaviorist. So you know, the dog's really worried about being touched because it's sore. So then they start showing aggression when someone comes near them. So you're really trying to rule out there being any kind of physical conditions going on. Mm-hmm. If you ever, if anyone ever wants advice on what they should be looking for, I'm always really happy and most veterinary behaviourists would be really happy just chatting through cases and kind of saying, well, you know, have you ruled this out? Have you done a full clinical examination? If possible, obviously there's Mm -hmm. some cases that it's not (laughs) really possible or, you know, appropriate to do that because it's going to be so stressful for the animal. Um, I actually often do a lot of gait analysis by video. If I've got a dog that really resents being handled and is quite fearful, I find that's really helpful. Mm-hmm. So slowing down videos and watching them in slow motion, you know, can show you a lot. So ruling out any kind of physical things for a cat with cystitis, you know, doing full set of bloods, doing at the bare minimum a urinalysis and mm. probably some imaging as well. So just making sure there's nothing kind of medical going on with that cat. And then, you know, referring them off to see me ASAP. I, again, most behaviorists are really happy to talk about cases. I always say to people, I like to work collaboratively. So I think the best way that the client gets the best result and the animal gets the best result is when you've got a behaviorist and a vet and them all working together kind of, you know, side by side. So, um, yeah, ruling out medical conditions and then just getting in contact with behaviorists as soon as possible really, I think, is the best thing to do. And I think don't be worried about the fact that you don't want the behaviorist to think you've done something wrong or you've given them wrong advice because, you know, I think we're completely non-judgmental and everyone's always trying to do the best thing. So yeah 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 definitely yeah i think that's i think that's exactly it you know i think sometimes it feels you know you you just you just want to make sure that you don't say the wrong thing but i think sometimes if if you feel you're saying the wrong thing the best thing to do is just stop and say okay i'm going to focus on what i can do which is definitely the medical workup you know like you said rule things and then and then hand over completely um, yeah and I think from my perspective you know the, I think the most important thing that GP vets can do is actually give that preventative advice right at the beginning so getting mm-hmm. those puppies and kittens and really talking about the things that we can do to mean that vet visits are less stressful for them later on so things like mm-hmm. you know just doing some really positive short vet visits when you've got a puppy coronavirus might make it a bit more tricky because a lot of practices aren't mm-hmm. you know wanting lots of, of throughput but COVID aside getting the puppies in for really you know positive um handling visits at the practice so they actually want to come in because mm. when they come in they get treats and you know they get handled um, and doing the same with cats as well so i think we're probably quite good most of the time about talking to puppy owners mm-hmm. but our cats tend to get kind of pushed aside yeah so talking through with kitten owners about handling so you know getting them to show them how to just t- gently touch the claws for the the nails to come out mm-hmm. going through just doing a little bit of kind of gentle raising of the scruff which is where you're going to vaccinate them and really getting them used to the cat carrier the majority yeah. of cats only get taken to the vets in a carrier or like you know the cattery uh-huh. and a lot of the time the actual carrier is associated with being stressed so really introducing that early i think is so important to do okay okay that's and do cats so do, with the kittens is it is it the same approach as puppies do they have a window of kind of socialization as it were um yeah okay they do. yeah so it's just a bit earlier which is the trickier thing so we mm. think in kittens it probably ends about sort of eight to ten weeks so by the time that clients have got them it's actually sort of ended doesn't mean that you can't make really significant progress so it's still so mm. important that we do that in australia there's actually kitten kindies a bit like puppy kind of classes and oh, nice. whatever they exist i don't think there's anything quite like that over here so just no. getting cat owners used to things with you know handling yeah. is so important yeah i mean those could be remote as well couldn't they i mean you probably wouldn't want necessarily want to have a number of kittens in one room i guess would you no is exactly that, and that, they actually no. generally do them without the cats so they're kind of oh, okay. yeah okay you no know, rather than yeah like you would do with puppies <laughs> like, yeah, i'm sort of thinking i've got this <laughs> vision of kind of like a, a room full of kittens thinking okay I can't amazing, see how... but yeah no yeah. they're kind of more information <laughs> evenings rather than yeah sort of actual socialization sessions I suppose 
I think resources are really good as well. You know, it's directing people to websites. I mean, because th- I think another challenge is, is just the time it takes to properly Absolutely. get into talking yeah. about those things and making use of, you know, I think making use, but, as, as, but, you know, handing over to the vet nursing team as well. You know, if you've got nursing staff that are interested in behaviour, yeah. you know, if they're, if they're really keen to start doing nurse clinics, then, then it's a great, great way of getting a real strong bond with the client, but also yeah. it's a good way of getting lots of information over to them as well. Oh, as absolutely. Well. And, you know, lots of clients will tell nurses things or be yeah. happy to tell them that they'd never want to tell the vet. So yeah. I think it is so important and they're so they don't want the vet for that reason. Yeah. yeah, they don't want that vet judgment almost, do they? But they sort of, no, sort of exactly. don't so, tell the vet, but this is what yeah. we're doing. And then the nurse the comes like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think we actually have a question. Sorry. Okay. So it's, could you guys go over what to look for in the consult room? Those little cues that tell us the dog isn't quite happy and that we should pick up um, and make the owners aware of. Yeah, I think that is so important to do. And I think a lot of the time um, as vets, we often become a little bit kind of immune to the fact that our patients are a little bit stressed because actually a lot of the time they're stressed quite a lot of the time. Or we might say, you know, I think I'm just going to pop a muzzle on him and the owners have no idea why they're like, but he's, you know, he's never bitten. I don't understand why you want to do that. So actually talking to clients about body language in the kind of here and now, I think is actually really valuable to do in a vet visit. So to say, well, actually, look, he's trying to avoid me when I go towards him, he's moving away or, you know, he's showing the whites of his eyes, he's licking his lips, he's panting. He was taking treats and now he's stopped. These are all kind of little signs that actually maybe he's not that comfortable. The other one we see all the time is the scratching, you know, that dog will start scratching or itching or sneezing. And then it's like, oh, he must be a bit itchy. And actually they're usually just these signs that they're a little bit, they displacement behavior. So they're a bit uncomfortable in the current situation. So talking okay. through those signs with the owners, I think is so important because they can start reading their dog's body language. So if we've got the clients that are really confident reading body language, they can avoid or um, identify situations that might be causing the dog stress, which they had no idea about. And I think anyone with a baby or a young toddler or a child should really have a really strong understanding of dog body language. So I think that is important to, to talk through. I don't know how, what do you see generally? Yeah, no, I, think, I mean, all of that, I think it's... Um... I think sometimes it's, it's, it starts outside the consulting room as well, doesn't it? You know, you can read a lot from if they're 10 minutes early and you're, you're finishing off with the client before and you go out to reception, you can see the dog is, you know, hiding underneath the yeah. owner's chair and, and just looks petrified. And like you say, some clients are quite aware of it and they, they will sort of call ahead and say, I'm going to keep him in the car until we can come in. And yeah. others they just, they just don't really seem to be, they, I think they think it's normal that a dog should be petrified at a vet. So yeah. they, immediately in their mind normalize it and then they kind of grab them out and you know come on time to see the vet now and you sort of and that's when you kind of start trying to just open that communication to sort of say I would be interested to know where so obviously I think you know talking about the challenges another challenge as the GP vet is that often you do only have a 10 or 15 minute slot to essentially get a job done you know if it's a vaccination or you know check a leg or, or something like that where where would you advise so you kind of you read those signs you recognize that a dog might not necessarily be so outwardly stressed that they're trying to bite everybody in sight so you can see that that, that kind of middle ground situation where the dog's getting nervous might snap you know but you're not quite there yet would you would you say right you know muzzle on get the job done or would you say actually let's sort of see if we can work on this over the next three months and do the yeah vaccination within a window what where where do you where's your take on that yeah so I think it depends on so I've actually got a little um uh flow chart that I made for one of my presentations for vets I think this is so important like when should we do things um, and when should we kind of stop so one of the biggest things I normally say is you know look at the dog you know how stressed are there and there are actually kind of stress scales that you can use a little bit like you know body condition score scales so where, where is the dog lying and how urgent is the thing that we're doing so if the dog has been, you know, hit by a car and we need to examine it, then probably we need to push on with what we're doing. And, you know, obviously appropriate um, pain relief. 
and maybe sedate the dog. If they're really stressed, you know, probably the best thing for them to do both from a medical perspective and also a behavioral perspective is actually have them sedated and not have them under that kind of, you know, stress of being awake. If it's something routine, like it's a nail clip or a vaccination, I think the temptation always is to get the job done because the clients come with the expectation that you're gonna do something. But I think it is really important that we kind of explain to them why we don't wanna do that. So we don't wanna pin them down and just kind of vaccinate them or do their nails because probably all they're gonna do is make them so much worse for next year. So if you go, look, we've just got to, you know, pin the dog down, do the nails and just move on. So we've got 10 minutes. Next time you go near the dog in a consult, the dog is going to be, you know, potentially trying to avoid you more or being more aggressive because they've learned that you don't listen to them. You just do it anyway. Mm. So I think you've actually explained that to owners and say, look, I'm not being awkward. I'm doing it for your dog's well-being, their emotional well-being. And I want them to have a good relationship with me moving forward. And if it's something that you need to do that you actually just don't have the time to desensitize them appropriately for the time that it needs doing. So like, you know, if you've got a vaccination, you don't have a long time to do the desensitization. Those would be the times I'd be using medication for that visit and then working on it longer term. So sending them home and saying, you know, I'm going to give you whatever medication it is that, you you know, we deem appropriate, give them that medication at home and then get them to come back into the vets. Mm. So that kind of current experience isn't negative. And we use things like treats, you know, licky mats, whatever it is that we want to do to make the visit more positive. Mm. And then for next time we work on desensitization. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, and that's, that's, I mean, that's kind of what we, what we do at, at our practice. And I have to say it, it's, it does really work. You'd be, it's yeah. surprising how quickly it can work as well. You know, you sort of have a dog that comes in often, often it's, it's maybe a rescue dog. So it's an adult dog that the client sort of doesn't necessarily yet feel no inside out yeah and they sort of bring them in and there's quite a lot of surprises surprise how the dog reacts or, or things like that but actually just taking time and saying okay let's do this over three or four visits with you know medication if necessary it's surprising how by the third or fourth visit the dog actually is coming yeah. in and, and is comfortable and happy and maybe it's a two-way thing as well you know as vets we get to know them as well yeah. you know and so you get to and I have a good idea of your patients but. and the dog develops trust that you're not going to make it do something that it's really uncomfortable doing so you kind of build that trust on on the dog's part as well as the client's part as well as you know your part and I think you know I always think the the person that's seeing that dog next year or the year after is going to be so thankful for the fact that you didn't just push it just this once Mm. because you had to get it done or you know you're running late and it's just no time because for the dog it makes such an impact on their you know their long-term learning Mm. if you do that that one time tempting as it is Mm. yeah yeah I think it's, it's important is there any other questions no, there's not. Um, so is there anything that you kind of do in clinic that makes a difference, do you think, in terms of making the, the visits less stressful for the animals? Um, I think we, so we, I think there's a, cu- a couple of things immediately. So certainly we, we try and think about the timing of the consult. So if we have a, a cattle dog that we know is going to take longer or, or just needs an empty reception or, or anything like that, uh, you know, we'll try and book it in a, in a slot that, that makes sense, you know, um, where maybe we know we've got a gap coming up so we can, we can get them in last. Um, we try, we do try and always, you know, make things positive distraction techniques. So licky mats, we use a lot, especially with poppies. Um, Mm -hmm. I think with, uh, certainly with cats, we have the, uh, the, you know, fairly way spray on the blankets that we can, we can sort of have in reception to cover them over. Good. We are cat friendly. So we've got separate, you know cat waiting sense. areas which which really yeah. you know it's so i've worked in i've worked in quite a few practices um when i was locoming and then you know just over the course of a career and it's it is obviously over 13 years a lot has changed as well because of the fact that we understand it all more yeah absolutely but you do these things they do they seem so they seem so small but they do definitely make a really big difference that cat that has sat in the waiting room on its own without a dog with a fed away blanket over it does just seem to come in and you can do stuff that that you know traditionally the client might say oh you you well you won't be able to do this you won't be able to do that but it does you know it does seem to genuinely yeah. have an oh, absolutely and I think the biggest thing with cats is if you had a stressed cat in that room not bringing another cat straight in there because they're mm-hmm. going to sense all that kind of stressed pheromones in the room and you're going to find it much harder for the next cat or the cat after that if you don't change rooms if you've got two consult rooms that makes a big difference oh, well. that's now that's interesting yeah. that's a really interesting so so if you're doing a cat so we do try and have cat uh 
clinics where we'll kind yeah. of only see cats in a block of consoles. But you would so and normally we would have a cat room and a dog room. Yeah. But if if it was a cat only clinic, would you say to use the dog room, then the cat room, then the dog room? If there's no if dogs there coming in, cats coming in, then that probably would be better to do. Yeah, just okay. to kind of if you've got a cat that's particularly stressed, then I would just you know give that room a good airing before you and give it a good clean, which you would do anyway. Yeah, yeah. Before you get another cat in, because they'll probably be more stressed again. They can give it a good and you do get that. You do definitely get that, don't you? you get those days where the yeah, cats just all the cats cranky. are really cranky. You know? <laughs> and you're like, what is this? Something in the in the air? Is it the weather? Yeah. Like, what is going on? But one yeah. just triggers and they sort of just all, all pick up on it, don't they? Yeah. And, you know, if you've got time, if you've handled the cat, I'd change your scrub top as well because you're going to probably okay. mm. yeah, nice. give it a bit of a spray, fell away. Mm. And yep. another thing that I, I sort of sometimes wonder um, is obviously now a lot of practices will use treats as um, you know, positive re reinforcement for their dogs. Um, and I, and I, you sort of, you know, it nearly always works and they always, come in positively but you do then almost find some that tip the other way where they are so unbelievably excited about getting a treat that coming to the vets is, is just this crazy bonkers party time where they have been to the puppy parties they love everybody there you know you all you want to do is palpate the abdomen and they're rolling over and they're doing everything. Yeah. yeah exactly this is the best thing ever have you i mean i suppose that's better than having a dog that's nervous but what would you suggest there like do we need to be bit careful not to over treat or do we you know what, what's your what's your yeah advice? so I think sometimes those really over almost excited dogs can have a little bit of conflict so if you've got two different motions going on if you're a little bit worried but you're also a little bit excited about being there having two conflicting emotions can sometimes really kind of um, almost escalate the behaviors that you're seeing so sometimes they're not always just positive 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 sometimes there might be a little bit of anxiety actually underlying okay. those behaviors if they are just genuinely really excited, then I'd start almost doing a little bit of kind of training. So getting them to sit calmly before they got a treat, you know, rather than just being like a, a treat free for all. Once they've had a few treats when they first come in, got them a bit settled, get them to kind of sit down and, and almost reward calm behaviors that you want to encourage. Mm -hmm. No, don't reward jumping up. Um, don't reward those kind of behaviors, I think would be the, the thing to do. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We actually have another question as well. Okay. So Rhiannon says, would you recommend muzzle training dogs from a young age before needing it? If so, how would you broach this idea with dog owners? So um, yes, I do. So if I ever speak to puppy owners, um, I sometimes do um, advice calls before someone gets a dog. And I think all dogs should be muzzle trained. I'm quite passionate about it. The way that I explain it to clients is that I say at some point, your dog might be, hopefully not, but they might be in a situation where they get hurt or something happens and we are going to muzzle them at the vets. You know, if they're really, really painful or really nervous, they're going to get muzzled. And if we've kind of introduced that muzzle as another training aid, so it's the same as a halter or a collar or, you know, whatever else it is that you're using for your dog, then I don't think that it should be any more aversive than that. If you've done it in a really positive way and it is important to do it in a positive way, I think they're a great tool. I don't know what you think, James. I do. I think, so the, I, I mean, essentially what i would say about muzzle training is that it's my go-to uh kind of salvage advice so when i get somebody that comes in who comes in with a complaint of aggression towards towards other dogs maybe more so than towards people but if they come in and, and they want to talk about aggression and you've done the, the pain work up and you can't find any real reason for it and and then you go through the kind of i'd like to refer you and la -da -da, you know but for whatever reason whether that's cost or time or they're just not that committed they just want a quick fix then i always feel that at least muzzle training is is your kind of it's kind of a bit of a go-to yeah because you're, you're never really going to do harm by positively training them to a muzzle no. but at least if that dog then has a muzzle on, on a walk then it, you've kind of there's a limit to how much damage it could do even if you i know that's not great for the individual dog yeah you, know, you want to address the behavior issue but if you haven't got a client that's committed I think if we encourage, if we take the stigma out of a muzzle, you know, then I think we would have so, so it'd be so much easier, wouldn't it? It would be absolutely. And if you do it in a really positive way, I've got a lot of clients where the dog is excited when you get the muzzle out, they're like, this is going to be great. I'm going to get something amazing. It's going to be chicken or cheese or whatever it is. And they'll, you know, they'll really want to put their face in the muzzle. And if you do that properly, there's nothing negative about it. 
And I always say to people, we don't use it to enable us to do things to your dog that we wouldn't be allowed to anyway. We just use it as a safety mechanism. So, you know, mm. if a you're walking your dog and something jumps out that you weren't expecting or a child runs out of nowhere on a scooter or whatever it is, you know, the worst case situation just can't happen because there's a muzzle mm. on, but we don't use it to enable us to walk your dog where they're not comfortable being walked. Yeah. I think you explain that to people. They kind of, they get it, I think. Mm. Mm. Yeah, definitely. I probably definitely. see, I'm, the people I see are probably a little bit more receptive to these kind of things, but I don't ever get any pushback with muzzle training. I don't know if you do. No, I think some you definitely get an initial kind of like, oh, you know, I don't think my dog's bad enough That's to need a muzzle. Dog. Yeah. You know, and, and but I think I think you can, you know, say to yourself, you sort of say, well, it's not, it's in no way a punishment, and, you know, and the dog eventually gets used to wearing it like it would, like it wears its collar or it's or yeah. it has a lead on and, and you know, make it positive. And, and, and I, I think it's great. I think most people then come around to the idea, whether they go home and then actually do start the muzzle training or not, I don't know. But you sort of Hopefully. try to follow up and you're like, is it okay? you know. Uh, um, yeah, no, I, I think it's important. I think if we can do that in puppy training as well, like if you, I think it's, it's just super important. Mm, mm. Yeah. Let's see if anyone else has asked us any questions. Dark. It's quite a no, I don't think so. I don't know. My Facebook's just kind of had a bit of a phrase. No, I don't think so. Is there anything, any kind of burning questions that you have for a veterinary behaviourist? What's kind of? I mean, my 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 main my main questions with behaviourists, you know, when it comes to behaviour, is what we talked about initially. You know, it's that thing of what what where's where's the the sort of the the, the referral point? Where where do you want us as GPs to 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 be? Um, I th and then um, I think the other thing that can be quite confusing is is the medication aspect of things. You know, when do we? Because obviously there's there's the difference between I think the so there's the difference between the veterinary behaviourist who can also prescribe the vet in the middle, the GP vet who might sort of want to do the right thing, but will self admittedly say, I, you know, I will I'm quite happy to take guidance on it. And then the clinical behaviourist who can't necessarily prescribe but could certainly advise the vet. So I find with my prescribing i'm happy to to prescribe for things like fireworks you know the, the the medications around that um but then i never quite know whether i am in the position really to be able to to go forward from there whether we should be using uh, them or not yeah. yeah yeah or whether whether we should be saying really this should be a case for a veteran behaviorist should be the one to prescribe. You see yeah. what I mean? so where the where the boundaries are around that yeah so i guess in when I see a case, I kind of always think it through in my mind when I should be using um, medication and when not. So I always think we should use medication if it's something unavoidable. So if it's something that's unpredictable and unavoidable, then probably the dog will need medication. If it's something we can't go, you know, if we just don't walk him in, in this particular park or there might be a certain type of person that they're not, you know, they're not very comfortable with. If it's not avoidable, then probably we would need to be using medication. If the behavior is really um, quite exaggerated, so for example, if it's a dog that's really fearful of people or other dogs and the threshold at which they react is really far away, it's really difficult to do any kind of training in that perspective because you can't get in there because the dog's already kind of gone over threshold and being really stressed. So that would be a case that I'd be thinking about using medication. And if the dog is just really kind of chronically anxious or chronically stressed, and that might be interfering with learning, I'd be using medication in those cases as well. So I think if you're working with a, an APBC um, animal behaviorist, then sometimes they might refer them back to you for, you know, ruling out there being any kind of pain or any kind of medical condition that might be causing or contributing to the behavior and for assessment of medication. So I always say to people, and this is kind of how I've always run my practice in Australia, I always am happy just to chat through cases. So if you're not sure about drug doses and um, sort of what drug to pick or doses, because often the, the dose is quite varied in the formula, yeah. you're not sure kind of where to go. Then I say like, we're all colleagues, just give someone a ring. And I'd much rather that the dog got the best, the best medication or the most appropriate medication. And I'm always happy to chat to, to other vets. So um, yeah, if anyone wants to email me, feel very free. It's how I we kind of did it in Australia, so I'm very happy to kind of do the same thing over here. Oh, yeah, no, it's good. It's 
and I think that's you know that that's I think that's it, isn't it? It's, it's about having a relationship with somebody. We work very closely with Rosie Beskeby, yeah. who many of you will know, um, and it does become a really reassuring two-way kind of relationship where where you know we'll kind of refer to each other, and I and I we will we'll listen to each other, and, and you know, and ultimately, eventually, you get to the point where the right decision has been made because everybody's talking to each other and the communication is yeah. open. And I think sometimes um, the more behaviour you do, the more confident you become in behavior so mm. look I see it as a, a stream of medicine like everything else like you know dermatology or internal medicine or whatever it is so it's almost like the more you do the more confident you become in that kind of mm. prescribing thing so sometimes it doesn't take that many cases to start you know becoming confident yeah 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 all right well I think we're done actually um so if anyone else has any questions or anything for me that you can head over to my life on four legs Facebook page I'm always happy to answer um, but thank you very much for your time. Yeah, thank you very much. Nice to see you, you again, <laughs> See you soon. All right. Bye.